the tax man cometh. He's just a few days away now. So we're going to talk about taxes as they stand today and taxes how they might stand tomorrow with a Biden tax package. Plus, our one-on-one -on -one with Heather Zumaraga. You're not going to want to miss this one today on the BizPo Show. Welcome back to the BizPo Show. I'm Seth Denson, joining you from Dallas, Texas, as always with my buddy up north, Dan Geltrude. Dan, how are you, bud? I'm doing good, Seth. How's everything, pal? Man, I, it's got to be better for me than it is for you. America's accountant on April the 12th. Uh, I got to think that things are kind of happening in around your world. This is a little bit of uh, maybe your Super Bowl season? <laughs> well, uh, things are a little busy, and, and let me say the reason why is is because even though there's been an extension of the due date from April 15th to May 17th. We are trying to ignore that, and we are full steam ahead to try to get done on April 15th because as the weather's getting warmer, we certainly don't want to be stuck in the office or stuck at home grinding through tax returns. We want to get out and enjoy ourselves, although for those where we need a little bit of room, a little bit more time, it, it is nice to have that extra month. Well, listen, I can't turn on my television anymore without seeing you, which is fine because I like seeing you here too, but <laughs> it, it, it's always an indicator for me that it must be, be around tax season. There must be a lot going on in tax policy because who better to talk to about it than America's accountant, right? And so talk to me a little bit. There's a lot of rumblings, not just this year's taxes. What might next year's looks like if uh, President Biden gets his way? What are your, what's your take on that? Well, uh, you're right. There's a lot happening out there, Seth. And the, the big headline is, is that the rich and corporations are going to pay more. Now, is that going to happen? I think so. I think so. Because remember, President Biden can talk all he wants about raising taxes. He needs Congress and he needs basically every single Democrat to be on board. So a lot of the negotiating related to what the ultimate tax package is going to look like from a Biden administration is going to be driven by the negotiations within the Democratic Party. And there are Democrats that are concerned about how much tax and spending is going on. Now, what I just want to tell our viewers related to this, Seth, is we are, I believe, headed into an economic boom. How long is it going to last? A year, maybe two, maybe longer. But when we round the corner of this pandemic, I think we're going to be in a really good place. As a result of that, I think Biden feels he can get these tax increases through and not really feel it. But the sugar high is going to wear off. The economy will start to slow down and maybe even dip set. And then you know what we're left with? Tax increases. And that could lead to a stagflation situation for our country. And that's really bad. Yeah. You know, Dan, the only thing I might push back on, because I agree, I think that our economy is certainly headed in the right direction. All the indicators are that there's light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, I mean, it's hard not to, to see some economic upside when you've got low tax or no, low uh, interest rates. And so the cost of capital is really cheap. So people are making investments. Um, you've got literally trillions of dollars that have been thrown into the system. Uh, so liquid, you know, we're in a highly liquid situation with cash available to do things. Um, and then we, you know, listen, the economy is in real good shape before the pandemic. That was the one thing that this wasn't a bubble that burst. This was a pandemic that shut down. We're coming back. My, here's my concern with that. I think that specifically, small businesses are still down and small businesses are still struggling. And while yes, capital is cheap, so it, small businesses may be able to kind of come back and do this. My fear is tax policy, even if done today, while there may not be long-term impact for a year or two down the road because of how good the economy sh or shape the economy is in, um, it could prevent, it could prevent small businesses from doing what we would hope they would do and take a risk and do things. Maybe that, maybe that stalls the economy. And I don't know, that's maybe just a concern of mine is, listen, things are going really well. They look to be going really well. Let's not just go throw a monkey wrench in the whole thing. 
You may be right, Seth, but here's the thing. We won't actually know because if we do have the tax increases, and again, they're coming, how big, we'll see. We won't really know what could have been, right? Because that's an unknown. Well, if we had not had tax increases, would we have grown even more? But what I truly believe is at some point the economy will slow down and whatever the tax increases are, we're stuck with those. And I just think that's such a bad formula for our country, makes us uncompetitive around the world. And, and it's just I couldn't disagree more with what the plan is. Yeah, you know, listen, I say it all the time. Trickle economics is real as much as people want to deny it. People lie. Numbers don't. And trickle, that can happen both ways, good or bad. Nonetheless, we, our guest this week, Heather Zumaraga, man, is she smart. She knows the economy. She knows business. Likely, if you've had your business uh, television network on lately, you've seen her. Uh, well, she joins the BizPo Show right after the break. Welcome back to the BizPo Show. Well, if you're someone that follows the business sector or on really any media outlet, likely you've seen our next guest. Any news or business outlet, whichever one just popped into your head, yeah, that one, Heather Zumaraga has been on it. She's a go-to in the business sector, is one of the most intelligent people on or off of Wall Street, and has even found time to recently write a fantastic book, The Man's Guide to Corporate Culture. You can catch me and Heather each week at 1245 Eastern on Newsmax, but you can catch both of us along with Dan Geltrude right now on the BizPo Show. Heather, welcome. Hey, Seth. Good to be here. Hey, Dan. Hey, Heather. Thanks for coming on. Well, See you guys. Listen, I, there are literally dozens of questions that we could ask, but, you know, we have to make sure that we stay in time here. But maybe let's just dive right in and, and start talking specifically about the economy. And I recognize this is probably a very broad question. Uh, but I really want to get your take on where the economy truly is. You know, with the government pouring trillions into the system, interest rates remaining historically and, I mean, in my opinion, maybe even unsustainably low, we're nearing the end of the pandemic. All signs are there's light at the end of the tunnel. Everything's great. Why do I have a pit in my stomach? Well, I don't blame you. I think of uh, institutional investors and asset managers are feeling the same way. Maybe not if you're a retail uh, investor or day trader. You think everything's great. The stock market, I think the S&P is hitting new highs almost every day as well as the NASDAQ. And so it feels good, right? But maybe a little too good, like party like it's 1999. And the problem is that you can't really tell where the economy would be coming out of the pandemic because of the trillions of dollars in money printing. And we're talking about trillions more, the infrastructure plan. Uh, the the more rounds of stimulus and and supplemental unemployment bonus. I know many Americans lost their job. Over 10 million still unemployed during the pandemic a year ago when desperately needed help. But at what point in time are we going to kind of rein that in and say, okay, you now have to go back to work. You have to look for a job. There are over six million job openings, and so you couple all of the trillions of dollars in money printing with uh, the, the monetary side of it, the fiscal side, which I know, Dan, you talk about, too, um, on various networks and news shows about near zero interest rates. I mean, the Fed, this is not 2008. So the Fed is keeping interest rates low as long as they can. So corporations are borrowing, people are borrowing at lower rates. Everything's fine as long as rates stay low. But as long as soon as rates tick higher, there's a big problem. There's a big problem. So with that, I mean, what do you tell the everyday man and woman right now? I mean, I'm not talking about the hedge fund manager, the day trader, the Wall Street insider, the people who can get access to people like you, right? I'm talking about Joe Soccer Dad and Susie Soccer Mom, right? They're worried about their 401k. Is this a good time to refinance my house? What's going to happen with my job? What's the future look like? What do those folks need to keep on their radar right now? Yeah, well, everything looks good as long as they're running the printing press and we have all these new fiscal stimulus programs going. But... Look, if you're fortunate enough to be one of the many Americans that have an IRA, you make sure you have some exposure to stocks. Could stocks pull back? Yes. But if you're not nearing retirement and you have exposure to the equity market, to the stock market, that, that would be a very good thing during an inflationary time. You can also have exposure to hard assets like commodities, like gold and silver, for example. Um, I guess cash is king. If you've had money in the market, you've made 
a lot of money. Let's say you've been one of those lucky ones during the pandemic that uh, had a piece of the NASDAQ, which has got all those big technology names, the Facebooks, Amazons, Netflix, and Google. Maybe you take some profit and you wait and then you buy if there is a pullback. But again, this isn't 2008 because it's a little bit different that the housing, for example, the housing market, the lending requirements are still very strong. When you look at the Bank of America's and Wells Fargo, when you go to get a loan, it's not like 2008 where anyone, you know, as long as you wore shoes and had a checkbook, you could get a loan. It's still very tight lending requirements. But the problem is I do think, again, as interest rates tick higher, and that will be inflation, our reserve can no longer control and maintain interest rates near zero, the stock market will decline. And then, you know, hey, if you wait for a pullback and you have some cash on the sidelines, then you buy in. I've been waiting for a long time, though. I've been waiting for like a year <laughs> for the market to pull back. And if it has, it's been short lived. And like in the blink of an eye, you wake up and you miss, you know? Heather, I want to just change gears for a moment because there's been so much discussion out there about President Biden's tax plan. And I, I think you know exactly where I stand on that. But let's just say that the president is able to get his tax plan through, as I've been talking about. I'm not so sure he can do it. But let's say that he can. What do you think will be the fallout of the, the increases in taxes, particularly on the wealthy, and on corporations. Well, that's key. Can he get it passed? He, there's, I think the margin of error is, is very slim. If you're going to pass it through using reconciliation, you have to have all 50 Democrats on board, as you know. So Joe Manchin is key. And repealing the salt cap and allowing deductions, I think that's key to getting some of the Republicans on board and some moderate Democrats. But let's say it does go through. So you raise taxes, you raise a corporate tax from 21 to 28. You repeal the good things that whether you like them or hate them or without getting political, the Trump administration implemented these tax cuts. We saw massive amounts of jobs come back from overseas, meaning instead of putting you know, if I'm Microsoft or I'm Nike, instead of putting plant property equipment overseas somewhere else, say China, or taking advantage in Europe of one of the lower tax rates in you know, Ireland or Denmark, you bring back plant property and equipment in the U.S. and make us more competitive than ever. And so raising them back to 28 um, percent, I know that it's easy for some people to say, well, who cares? These big, bad, evil companies and corporations should pay their fair share. And, and that's true. They should pay their fair share, like, like Amazon paying zero federal taxes for many, many years. But the problem is they do take advantage of blue poles and deductions. And when you have money, not just as individuals moving from New York to Florida, but as a company, you can move. It does take years to shift your supply chain. So it's not immediate overnight. You move everything across, you know, across the ocean and, and vice versa and back to the U.S. But I, I would I think there are many businesses without making this political um, and corporations that will rethink where their plant property and equipment are headquarters and opening of new manufacturing plants if corporate taxes go back to 28%, because that makes us less competitive on a global scale. So the alternative is you get rid of some of those loopholes and deductions and you say, you know, everybody, everyone pay 15%. It's interesting. Bezos just said, Jeff Bezos, one of the world's richest men, of course, um, and, and I'm, I'm all in favor of that. I don't think there's any problem in, in acquiring wealth and hiring wealth. He's done many good things for the country. He said he likes this, the, the, the tax increase. But yet, then why have you not been paying whatever Democrats would say your fair share is for so many years? How do you get take advantage of it, the system where you're paying zero on you, and then you advocate for increasing the taxes on everyone else when you've done nothing but kill small businesses. And he's been a job killer for many years. It's hypocrisy. It's complete hypocrisy. Well, I agree with you there, Heather. And, and speaking of small businesses, they've really had a tough time through the pandemic. They, they've really taken it on the chin in so many different sectors of the economy. So 
if someone is out there now and they perhaps see some opportunity to be able to to live that American dream, to be able to start their own business, what kind of advice would you give them related to everything that's happening in, in the economy? And and let's face it, I think that we, we all know that the U.S. economy is probably going to have some substantial growth as soon as we can turn the corner. And I think we're starting to do that. So so what would you tell that person starting a small business right Right. Now? It's, it's a really hard time to start a small business. And if you've been fortunate to weather the storm over the past year, um, you're really, really fortunate. And I'm sure you feel like you're overwhelmed and you're just trying to keep workers um, as best you can and maintain your payroll because I'm hearing from small businesses that they can't find workers. So even though there are many millions of Americans that are out of work, the problem is some of them may not want to go back to work, say, at a warehouse type position for $15 an hour or less. And can you blame them if they're making more right now with government assistance? And I don't mean to say that people didn't need it. I want to be clear because everyone says easy for you to say or whatever. But the point is we need to incentivize people to work. And if you can't find workers because I make more with the unemployment supplemental bonus, including unemployment and including other benefits than I would working hard physical manual labor in a warehouse. I mean, I drive down the road, McDonald's now hiring. It says hiring now, Chipotle, car washes. They're not ideal jobs, I get it, but they're starter jobs for college kids. Let's get the college kids working. Let's get them at resume builders. If you're a small business though, um, I, I think it's important. I know you're trying to keep your head above water and I hate saying this, but you might have to shift some of the responsibilities of the lower paid positions, those job functions and roles to some of the higher paid positions. So then you can pay more and increases the stress and burden and weight on the shoulders of your other employees. But then you can pay more money and, and you're not out of workers. And the second advice would be digit digitization. So everything now is online and those companies that have thrived and succeeded, most likely it's because they have some online presence that's working for them, some e-commerce um, platform, because that's the future. Even post-pandemic, online shopping, for example, that's the future. I don't want to go to the stores anymore. I want the store to come to me. Heather, you wrote a book, a fantastic book. As a matter of fact, I meant to bring it into the studio with me. It's <laughs> over there in my office, and it's something that I'm, I'm going to have everybody here on its staff at GDP read, The Man Gui Man's Guide to Corporate Culture. I'm just curious, though, what led you to write the book? Uh, well, initially, HarperCollins Leadership, they have, um, I'm lucky to be part of a group where they have people like John C. Maxwell, Don Miller, uh, great business leaders and uh, speakers and also authors. And they came to me, they wanted to expand women as part of their lineup. And I think, I don't know, but this is, I guess, between you and I, that they wanted me to write a book of women in leadership, women in financial industry, or how to succeed in the corporate world as a woman, something related to gender. And I said, it's not that I didn't want to do that. It's that I said, well, what about the men? You know, there are so many initiatives right now, and, and rightfully so, and I support them, I'm behind them, of, you know, workplace equality, women in business, how can we all get ahead? And I'm thinking it leaves, hope you don't mind me saying, but like you men out. And and you're thinking like as a middle-aged man or if you're, if you're not a minority, well, where do I fit in? I'm not a woman or maybe you're not a, a minority. So no, it's like nobody cares about you. You've been left out. So I, so I thought the more people I work with financial advisors and the more that I spoke with, they said, Heather, I'm reluctant to hire women right now. They were, they're behind the initiative of a lot of different financial um, asset managers have big, uh, a push to hire more women and minorities. They're supportive of that, but they're like, wait a minute, post me Too movement. I don't want to get near it. You know, I don't want to touch it. I don't want anything to do with it because they're afraid of getting in trouble, even if they're a good guy, well-intentioned. But the problem is they might accidentally say something that could be misinterpreted or misunderstood. And they would tell me that in confidence. And I was like, oh, my God, they shouldn't be afraid to hire women. That, that the movement and this push... 
for diversity and and equal pay and narrowing the the gender gap was backfiring because some men and you don't have to say anything but they were saying they were a little bit hesitant to hire women because of the new norm the very politically sensitive culture we live in today good bad right or wrong again this is where the future is heading and so i thought they're not a hundred percent you know it's not a bible of rules to abide by that will work every time but this is a consensus that can help people protect their reputation and protect you stay and and help you stay out of trouble i mean assuming you know if you're not the, one of the cuomos out there because that clearly even though they're just allegations i mean there are some things that are just clearly crossing a line. It's not a gray area. Wow. Listen, if you've heard that and you're going, yeah, uh, there's more to it. There is more to it. And it's all in Heather's book. So make sure you go pick up a copy as quickly as you can. Pretty much, Heather, anywhere books are sold? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, but support your local uh, bookstores as well. Barnes and Noble or online. Target, Walmart have it. But local bookstore if it's open. Fantastic. Fantastic. Heather, thanks so much for being with us today here on the Biz Post Show. You're welcome to come back and join us anytime. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you on the television pretty quick. Thank you so much. You too, Seth and Dan. Have a good day. Thanks. Welcome back to the Biz Post Show. If you're a regular viewer, you know that Seth and I like to leave you with our final thoughts each week. So here's mine. You know, we've seen a lot in the news about immigration. And let's face it, some of these images are just heartbreaking to see children being thrown over the wall, to, be, to see children being left with no one and they're crying and they're asking for help. How does your heart not break for them? And forget what country you're from or what citizen you are, just to see that type of human suffering, well, that really pulls on my heartstrings. We need to get this immigration situation under control. And unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Now, of course, Donald Trump wanted to build a wall and he thought that was going to be the answer. I think that was a part of a plan, but not the end all be all. Look, we need to have immigration in this country. We want people to come here. However, we need to be able to control who comes into our country, not because we want to discriminate against anyone. Of course, we don't want to do that. We want people to be able to come here safely and to be healthy and to, and to have them come here for the same reasons, Seth, that our ancestors came here. They're looking for a better life and they want to contribute to their new country. So all I can say is, Congress, Mr. President, please get your act together, go down to the border, inspect what's going on. Let's figure out how to solve this problem and let's try to keep everyone safe, our citizens and the people who are trying to come to our country. And that's my final thought. Well, Dan, for my final thought this week, I'd like to talk about boycotting. You know, back in the day, we'd boycott based on how we engaged our time and our money. But now we do it as a virtue signal, <laughs> whether it be the state of Georgia, Major League Baseball, Coca-Cola, or now even talks of the 2022 Olympic Games in Beijing. Everyone is jumping onto the cancel culture boycott edition. Stop. You don't like Georgia's new law? Okay. Well, first, maybe recognize that their law is pretty similar to about a dozen other states that have similar laws, but no one's really talking about that. Nonetheless, if you don't like it, don't go to Georgia. By the way, you're not going there doesn't do anything to anyone that made the law. Just the citizens and businesses who depend on economic engagement. You don't like that the Major League Baseball Association pulled the All-Star game from Atlanta? And by the way, I don't either. Okay but I'm not gonna stop watching my Texas Rangers. And quite frankly, I've never been a big fan of Coca-Cola anyway, not because of their politics. I just, I'm more of a Dr. Pepper guy. Regardless, all this talk of canceling and boycotting, it really just creates more noise. No one's actually changing. And now, 
There's talks of the U.S. boycotting the 2022 Olympics because of China and their steps that are being taken around the world that maybe we don't like. Again, I don't support the steps taken by Communist China's Chinese Party. But as for the athletes that have worked their whole lives to be part of the Olympics, to represent their country, to represent the United States, a chance that so few get, and when those that do, they likely only get it once. We want to take that away from them? Heck no. I've got a better idea. Show up and win. Win as many medals as you can and bask in the glory. Boycotting doesn't do much, but winning does. Not everything in this world needs to be full tilt and not everything needs to be a fight. I think President Biden said that actually. I sure wish he and others would start living it. But like most things, you know, they probably won't. So it's up to you and me. If you don't like something, just don't do it. But don't feel like you must take a hard line on everything. Differing opinions are fine, arguments are fine, but boycotting everything you don't like, that just needs to stop. The free market allows you to decide where and when you do what you do. So speak with your wallet, not your Twitter account. And that's my final thought. Excellent, Seth. Well, that does it for this week's show. We hope you'll tell your friends about us, and we hope you'll continue to tune in. From New York City, I'm Dan Galtrude. And from Dallas, Texas, I'm Seth Denson. Good night.